And we are recording. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fourth digital transformation in government conference uh, on the Friday, the 16th of June. Uh, we are fortunate now to have uh, Dr. John Halligan. He's from the University of Canberra, Australia. Okay, and he's going to be talking about exploring the relationship between digital era governance and public administration. John is the Emeritus Professor of Public Administration and Governance, Faculty of Business, Government and Law at the University of Canberra. Research interests are comparative public management and governance, particularly in the Anglophone countries. I know Canada's not an Anglophone country, but it's okay. <laughs> Anglophone countries, okay, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. His major current project is the development of a digital government and uh, digital government and transformation with a focus getting old here on the digital and comparative perspectives. Uh, select books with colleagues, policy and advice on the Westminster tradition. He's got a raft of books. I really recommend that you read his uh, profile uh, on the on the conference site. Now, without further ado, uh, we're absolutely delighted to have somebody from the public administration side uh, present, as well as from the technology-oriented side as well, because th this is what's going to make the difference with respect to the implementation of digital transformation. So without further ado, I will turn everything over to John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keep it closed. Right. Well, uh, Rob, thank you very much for the introduction, and it's wonderful to be here. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't encountered very much of the event simply because I'd already planned a visit to Ottawa to conduct interviews with uh, uh, participants in, in digital government. Uh, and so I was able to come a day early and catch uh, the 16th, but that was about it. Uh, I should note that on group, I discovered that my uh, disk by which I was transferring my PowerPoint uh, could no longer, was no longer function. So I've had to do a new one. Uh, so if, if it is a little scrappy in places, that is because it was redone under pressure. But uh, it won't be as quite as elegant as I would have hoped. Uh, I did start off with a bit of colour to brighten things up, but the system seemed to be taking over and doing things I didn't want. So I'm afraid it peters out very early on. So sorry about the rather mo the monotony of what you're about to receive. So um, the purpose is. Well, my purpose is partly blocked out here, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, here just a second. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, good. Enough. Very good. Good. Okay, no worries. So I'm interested in examining the relationship between public administration and digital transformation from several perspectives. There's been quite a long debate about the relevance of models of public administration, including what is called digital era governance as a reform model. But there are also lots of interesting issues about how to account for variable progress towards digital government. One type of analysis is to examine the effect of government structure and administrative traditions on country systems. Digital agendas feature in government strategies, but what priorities may include efficiency, support to the economy, inclusiveness, uh, user engagement, and even be influenced uh, by rigid ideological agenda. 
So institutional factors shape the pattern of change for digital government, uh, with public administration constituted, the pre-existing system that is, in ways at variance from digital agenda, uh, which seeks to operate under new business models. There was a lineup of contending positions of varying weight and significance about policy design, data governance, business model renewal, holistic and open government, and institutional uh, change for the traditional mandarins. So I try and cover these points and then briefly review uh, some of the implications of current debates and scenarios. So by way of background, the digital uh, government study is with a colleague, Paul Henman, of the University of Queensland. Uh, I think in some respects, though, there's been quite a long gestation. I mean, the origins of the project predates COVID, and the emphasis was somewhat different at that particular point. Uh, but in re-engaging with it, uh, in recent times, we feel like we are back to some extent in an investigatory phase, exploring a number of questions. So you could argue that in some respects, this is a project report. Perhaps if Bob has me back next year, you will get something more uh, complete. So we're seeking to, at this point, learn from participants in digital government through interviews to come in four systems. Uh, so Canada uh, proceeds next week. Um, I've already been to the UK once uh, this year and will return later. Uh, and I'll be going to NZ for the second time. So what about this focus on Anglophone countries? You may wonder why the word Anglophone is being used, particularly given the cultural context of this country. Uh, it partly comes out of the comparative government literature, uh, which talks about different sorts of traditions. And the, the term often used in the past, particularly by Europeans, was to brand the English and the associated countries as Anglo-Saxon but that does seem to be a bit narrow. So some people uh, use the word Anglophone, which is less uh, reflective of the nature of the country, more of the institutions which have long ago um, inherited uh, from the UK. So um, it makes sense in some respects to take these four uh, for comparative purposes and I've done that with my last two books. So now the thing about uh, these countries is that as with um, other countries internationally, early successes were reflected in high international rankings, which then dropped either because they couldn't be sustained that is what they were doing, uh, the, the progress, or because more agile systems leapfrogged them. Now, I think much of that story is pretty well known, so I'm not really going to say much about the others. Uh, for me, or for us, Paul and, and, and myself, we're more interested in looking at uh, institutional questions, complexities, uh, and digital public administration issues than uh, the digital stars, uh, as they might be called. Um, I should add at this point that Paul uh, shares this interest with me, uh, but he also has done uh, uh, published a number of papers uh, on the use of portals internationally uh, and technological innovation. He writes about AI and other things. Uh, since I'm an academic, uh, I do put one or two references at the back if you want to uh, go further with that. So um, in terms of an institutional approach, well, for our purposes here, um, 
we're more interested in the question of reform in general, how it has been handled over time and in the current era. In other words, there are lessons to be learned from how the four countries uh, have performed with public sector reform, uh, because you can see many of the issues uh, which exist today uh, when you put the digital alongside government uh, uh, persist. So uh, that's partly why we take a sort of public se sector reform approach as one of our starting points. Uh, different uh, phases of reform have been captured by many authors, um, uh, including uh, Margetts and Dunleavy's uh, notion of digital era governance, which is now into its third formulation. Now, I'm not going to go into those uh, uh, models, if you like, in any detail, uh, but just to say that our concern, and I might note that Amanda Clark of Carlton uh, shares that concern, is that uh, these uh, models, if you like, are much more likely to be normative or prescriptive, but they don't necessarily capture the sorts of things that we are interested in, which is more about the interface between our traditional system and these uh, upstart digital people who have appeared on the scene. So, so there is this question of how to conceive of digital government, because the, the word is often used quite loosely now in a number of different contexts. And I'm afraid we, we don't have uh, a definitive answer about that. Um, we need to bear in mind that it varies with context. It varies in different parts of the public sector with different agencies and how they may engage with uh, a digital transformation. So that's, that's one we're uh, going to continue with, but I'm not going to try and probe it any further today. So what about accounting for variable uh, progress? Well, there is this question of administrative tradition, um, which I'll expand on. Uh, there is also the question of uh, structure and scale. Uh, there's the dominance of mainstream public administration uh, and machinery. And then there's this question of the distinctive nature uh, of the Anglophone countries, uh, which to a greater or lesser extent um, share some important features of relevance to this exercise. So, um, so the argument is that traditions of countries uh, affect the ability to change and innovate. And here there is meant to be a reference to a recent PhD uh, by uh, a German woman uh, who, who was referenced at the end where she uh, was concerned about the fact that Germany did so badly uh, in the overall scheme of things. So she did a comparative study of Denmark, France, and And uh, what she decided were among the more important variables were these, the question of structure, which I've mentioned before, uh, the political, uh, cultural nature of the systems. Uh, and in particular, she reports that uh, it was their disposition or how they handled implementation. So uh, in some other countries, uh, the problem may lie at the top end. Uh, and so far as the traditional political elite is not necessarily very digital lit literate um, and likes to have uh, people with other expertise on tap rather than necessarily embracing things. But in this particular case, uh, the, the problem with, uh, uh, the, in the German case, and I should note that she was only talking about digitalization. There was nothing else beyond that. So in that sense, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, but she, uh, it was the actual uh, uh, people who had to execute 
uh, strategies or plans. So in other words, uh, the bureaucratic tradition uh, of Germany is uh, based heavily on the rule of law. Uh, it's relatively inflexible compared to uh, uh, other uh, administrative traditions. Uh, so it was the bureaucrats down below who had to implement who were not actually engaging with the process. So th this is a simplification of um, her study, whereas they were much more agile in Denmark and France was somewhere in between. Because you know, Fran France does quite well if you accept the international rankings. Uh, <coughs> so it's referenced if you want to look at it. But with the public sector reform literature, more generally, um, there's been a large debate about how you characterize the models, which I'm, I'm not going to go, go into here to any great extent, but clearly uh, the Canadian public service uh, has been engaging with aspects of management for some time. It has not in, uh, gone for the rather more extreme manifestations of managerialism, which are apparent uh, have been apparent in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, but nevertheless, uh, it isn't the same game. But now it's accepted that hybridization um, has uh, has become uh, a more significant way of characterizing the fact that different public sectors have become an admix of different reform models, if you like. So to this, we now add the digital model, if you like. So, um, so this is one way of approaching it. How, how, do they, how, how does that relationship work? Well, finally, I seek to explain a little bit more about administrative traditions. Uh, I mean, they're, sometimes they're the Anglophone ones are defined in terms of what they are not. That is, they are not uh, based heavily on a rule of law approach, uh, which is associated with more Weberian bureaucracy and that sort of thing, which you get in other countries in Europe. Uh, on the other hand, the nature of their system allows them to change and innovate. They've been more disposed towards public sector reform, even if they haven't always been that good at implementing it. Uh, but the fact that they've been good at public sector reform, initiating public sector reform, uh, does not necessarily translate uh, to the digital sphere. And you wouldn't necessarily want the worst aspects to translate anyway. Um, so you can argue that to a greater or lesser extent, they favor instrumentalism and pragmatism. Uh, and this facilitates change and reform and historically, the embedding of man managerialism, because as you will all, all know, that Canada, in many respects, got into a management emphasis uh, through Glasgow earlier than other countries. But then we have, and this is where I try and bring in some of the um, uh, other countries, a, a different um, administrative tradition, which is the Nordic model. Now, on the one hand, they do encompass some of this rule of law thing, you know, the Germanic tradition, if you like. Um, so that, that overlaps with European countries. On the other hand, the influence of managerialism has affinities with the Anglophone model. But in addition, a core element is the communitarian tradition, which is intrinsically Nordic. So, uh, Nordic writers uh, have characterized their systems as being active, pragmatic reformers. So you can see in a number of respects, they're a bit like the Anglophone uh, tradition, but the mix is a bit different. Um, and that certainly has contributed to uh, their ability uh, on the digital side. So well, what about structure and scale? Um, there are interesting implications of different structures if we take it at the level of federal and unitary systems of government. Though we, we shouldn't just assume that a unitary system is automatically centralized. Uh, certainly one or two Nordic countries 
have been quite decentralised, but the power of the centre um, can be mobilised um, if it starts to lose too much control. <clears throat> now, you'll be familiar with the fact that federal uh, functions into ALIA encompass strong policy or national policy role, regulatory functions and delivery. But subnational systems have stronger delivery role and may, they may have uh, quite powerful directive capacity, uh, particularly with regard to local government at various. Now, one thing about, of course, the two federal systems uh, is that there are two important levels, I think, for our purposes, uh, because it's split between, the digital government is split um, between the centre and the provincial state level. Um, and as will be alluded to later, um, both New South Wales and Ontario uh, seem to show up pretty well in terms of how they've operated at that inter in that intermediate sphere. Now, small unitary systems show up well in international uh, rankings, and they may, of course, also incorporate local government. Um, on the other hand, the other extreme, the UK's large scale and organisational complexity is reflected in the most elaborate machinery centred on the cabinet office and involving multiple bodies. Um, and I, I think I provide detail later. Um, now, there are a range of other contextual fa factors which we might want to take into account. Uh, there's still this question about what are the, the key objectives well, as has been mentioned by others. Uh, there's always a strategic focus. Uh, on the other hand, the agendas are often overly ambitious. Uh, we had a minister who subsequently disgraced himself, but uh, he was pronouncing we were going to be the best, this is Australia, best in the world, uh, and we were going to be up there with Denmark. Um, there was more, a little more context on that later. Uh, but operationally, too often it's been efficiency. Uh, I mean, I first started doing work on uh, a sort of ICT e government uh, 20 or more years ago, and um, the, it was just assumed that the main purpose was more about efficiency. That was the primary purpose. And that continues to be the case both with conservative and non-conservative governments, but to varying extent. There's also this question of to what, uh, how much it's linked at, at, to a digital economy agenda. Uh, that has been also uh, an import, uh, important dimension uh, at different points in time uh, in several of the countries. Uh, now, one can understand that's uh, an important dimension. Uh, there is a question of to what extent it detracts from uh, digital change um, at the level of the, the public service. Um, other questions are the degree of central capacity, uh, capacity and digital spill deficits. Well, I guess everyone's been moving rapidly on trying to lift uh, schools uh, through uh, programs for public servants in general. Uh, on the other hand, we don't hear so much about what school development is occurring with leadership. Uh, so to what extent uh, have they managed to increase uh, digital li uh, literacy? So um, there are also some other interesting uh, side questions uh, about the role of supranational organisations. Um, OECD is an important reference point. Other rankings uh, are significant as well. And certainly a number of individual agencies uh, in these countries have special relationships, say, with part of OECD. So the ATO, the Australian Tax Office, uh, benchmarks itself against what is happening in the tax revenue area uh, in OECD, but in turn likes to think that it is well regarded in terms of a model for uh, progressing in that area. 
Um, this question of failure, uh, you, the words ICT sound a bit out of place here, but I'm talk, thinking here historically. Failure uh, in this area, and all countries have had their failures, uh, has been uh, a disincentive for public service leaders to engage. There's also the question of private sector consultants and their place, which I'm not going to go into. Um, and of course, I think we're all familiar with the complexity of the operating environment, uh, and in particular, the pace of digital change and knowledge. I mean, uh, the data, the rise of data in the last five years being uh, a wonderful example. So, well, what are political agendas? I've already alluded to these, so I, I won't repeat all the details. There's this central, uh, centrality of political executives' efficiency agenda, uh, agenda uh, over time, and that has continued. Um, there's the distortion of digital programs where you have neoliberal uh, agendas focus on small state uh, and, and developing or relying on private sector capacity uh, rather than the public sector. This is perhaps displayed more in the UK and uh, Australia. Uh, there are broader government agendas around incl inclusiveness. Uh, supporting the economy and the business sector. Uh, if you look at the NZ, the New Zealand case, you will see that uh, in a sense there's two levels. I mean, I was over there trying to learn about the development of another strategic plan or thought maybe it was the roadmap, what was happening there. Well, it, it's what was happening in the public service was located within these broader questions about uh, the economy and inclusiveness, and in particular, uh, lifting uh, the place of uh, Maori and Pacifica people. Uh, so, <clears throat> so there, there were these overriding agendas on top of the um, the actual focus on the public service. There's a continuing reluctance to properly resource the pace of legacy system replacement. Uh, on the other hand, and this is meant to be a positive note, um, there has there's the role of political leaders in kickstarting a new level of digital government. I'm afraid I don't have a Canadian example, but maybe you could tell me later. Uh, I mean, perhaps the best known was Minister Ward in the UK uh, and establishing the GDS at Gov.UK. Uh, we also had uh, Prime Minister Turnbull in Australia, um, who uh, introduced the DTO, and this was influenced by the UK. Uh, it was critiqued for being a startup, but the point was we actually got uh, a strategically focused unit at the centre, and that was what was important. Uh, and that's continued, it's evolved into a DTO. You can guess what that stands for. but. Now, this is just my uh, little case of uh, the worst example of, um, from Australia of failure. It's the, the so-called robo-debt, um, which is probably bad enough to have made it to other places in the world, but this reflected this obsession with austerity, balancing the budget, small government, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so a lot of the... Um, uh, capacity, transformative capability, uh, drew on external expertise. But then there was this overriding efficiency objective of what was called the Online Compliance Intervention Program, uh, fondly or otherwise known as robo-debt. Uh, I, I, perhaps I should add at this stage, um, the, the Labour government elected uh, last year uh, had mounted a Royal Commission into this, which will be reporting, uh, I think, round about in early July. Um, so this program involved, involved AI being used for automated debt assessment and recovery. So no one is particularly concerned necessarily or intrinsically with the fact that AI was used, 
it was the parameters with, with, within which it was used. And it was the obsession of the government for trying to get uh, clamped down on what they thought to be wealthy afford, which is, is largely fictitious. Um, so the credibility of a key aspect of transformation was challenged by the outcomes. By this, I mean citizen or user engagement. The government ignored citizen protestation about what it was doing to them because they were uh, landed with debt which they couldn't pay. There were official inquiries and other advice about the scheme's illegality and process failure over four years before it was terminated. And you can see the number of debts which were refunded. So, in some respects, this fiasco undermined the digital transformation agenda. The hope, it also undermined the public service, I might add, because uh, public servants were under, say, under such great pressure to conform uh, uh, that, in this respect, and a whole range of other areas, there was illegal activity and corrupt practices. Uh, but as the new public service commissioner commented recently, it did something to the soul of the public service because of what was the pressure uh, that public servants were put under. Okay, so this is just, um, a, a, I guess, a somewhat simplistic attempt to, uh, to engage with uh, some comparative data. Um, about the four systems. So uh, I've got our four, four targets, plus um, I've included New South Wales and Ontario uh, because of the, the, the last line. So you get the, uh, the portals listed there. Um, the New Zealand one is partial, but it's interesting because it's public private thing. I should note at this point that this uh, most of that data comes from a recently released report into MyGov called an infrastructure audit. It was released uh, several months ago. Um, and this is really meant to lift the game for Australia because uh, we are regarded as being behind a number of respects. So it starts, I could have, of course, given you uh, comparative data about stars, but this is just a sort of starting point. Now, um, Pia Andrews, who may be known to some of you, um, has worked in Canada, uh, in New Zealand, uh, the state of New South Wales, and possibly other places as well. And that's given her an opportunity to develop a few um, comparative perspectives. So in terms of delivery or user X, uh, she argues that uh, New South Wales and Ontario um, are integrated systems. And of course, she does have a position on this. Uh, this, of course, is optimal from her point of view. On the other hand, the two unitary systems are still pretty decentralized uh, for whatever reason, certainly in the case of um, the United Kingdom, the big players jacked up against central intervention. There's a well-known story there. Um, well, while Moore got something going, there was you know, a strong backlash against it. And so a number of the big players still do their own thing for many purposes. And uh, according to Piers, classification, uh, Australia and Canada are partly inter integrated. I wish she was here because she could probably explain this better than I could. So, well, the data thing is interesting. Um, uh, at, for how it has been worked through in practice, you could argue that it is a more natural fit in the traditional scheme of things and the, than the other digital agenda. Uh, we know there's been continuing uh, issues about uh, agencies being reluctant to share data. So this is really uh, putting uh, pressure on it. 
We also know, and here I'm drawing on uh, previous research about how, um, in what was called the Human Services Department, uh, which then eventually became Services Australia, there was a capability review um, undertaken and there was a severe critique about the fact that those who were developing uh, and advising on policy did not uh, bother uh, talking uh, to those who were implementing it. Now, while that data may be quite raw, uh, it, it could be worked up. So um, that this was an, an intra-organizational failure or so it was seen. Uh, one other interesting aspect is um, it's easier to mainstream the data thing, if you like, by installing an existing senior manager as data leader. So this has happened in a couple of cases. So you already have one of them, probably an economist, who's heading up the stats bureau. Well, okay, just make him the data leader. Um, so that, that's an easy solution, which fits in with traditional uh, ways of doing things. So now these are just a few points about options. How are we going? Okay, yeah, right. Yeah. Options for what I've called the two cultures. Now this is a, a simplistic thing, but it bears in mind uh, other comparisons in the past. So on the one hand, you have uh, digital people and quite starkly, the digital specialists uh, uh, have come up uh, from a different place to the traditional public servants. Uh, very often they've come from the private sector. Uh, and this question of how they coexist, uh, it's also a question of what extent uh, they can aspire to be leaders. Uh, and certainly one of the people uh, I spoke to in uh, White Hall uh, begrudged the fact that there was no future. You know, the door was shut uh, for people like herself. Um, so, I mean, there are other ways of handling things. You can separate out functions. And well, I've, I've already indicated you have, and it's quite appropriate to have uh, service delivery uh, agencies. Um, but, uh, there is this question of lodging uh, activities and specialised agencies. Um, I've already alluded to the fact that skill development has become so central. Um, but the interesting thing uh, about the data is that it does link up with policy de development uh, in a way which the system understands. Now, there are a few other issues here. There's this coordination whole of government thing. Uh, which uh, continues. There's the question of public service leaders must still report upwards or vertically. Um, so, and that, of course, has been uh, one of the um, problems historically. As the um, Manzoni, the, operate, the, oper the chief operating officer of the UK civil service said a few years ago, um, well, no, you can talk about the vertical and the horizontal axis and, you know, all the trendy stuff said we must coordinate, collaborate, of course, uh, break down the silos, but we're still yeah. operating vertically in the story. So we have to see how that's going to work through. Um, so, and I've already alluded to the fact that the experience might be quite different uh, depending on the type of agency, whether uh, it's a delivery agency or not, etc. So um, I'll move through this quickly because uh, I want to leave a little time for questions at the end. Um, here is the example of the elaborate machinery which exists in the UK. It's centered on the cabinet office, involves six bodies, steering group, of course, are firm secretaries, uh, DMs in your language. Then you have steering, then you have D -D DGs, Director Generals Transforming. Uh, then you have uh, uh, civil servants on operational. You finally get a, a D&D &D board, 
but they are permanent secretaries. Uh, and finally, you get um, uh, a functional leadership group, uh, which includes, I would think, data or digital specialists. Uh, and they have accountability. But you have these layers above them. Um, so I'm I keep trying to find out what this means in practice. Uh, New Zealand also has a two-level coordination, but I think we can leave this. So it, points I've already covered uh, for any your questions, I'm not going to uh, repeat. Uh, this question of implementation uh, is exemplified um, by the UK's progress with digital strategies. Uh, you may have heard Yvonne Gallagher speak um, uh, earlier this week. Uh, well, in one of the last great reports produced by the National Audit Office, it just indicates that they've had 11 digital strategies in 25 years, and they all addressed the same basic issues. Um, they're still, and the issues are still there. Um, and I finished there about the legacy um, issue. So in summary, we're focusing on the interface between digital and government and how we want to see how that relationship is being uh, worked through. We're not necessarily taking big positions on this. Uh, we want to see how and in what respects it can be made to work and in different contexts. So the final observation is, given the uneven record with public sector reform of these countries, which have been long regarded as reformist, compulsively reforming, can perennial issues of implementation, coordination and collaboration, et cetera, be resolved? So there's some references. That's it. <laughs> Uh, start for some questions. Great, thank you. Okay, super. Let me just uh, get the uh, where'd they go? Okay. Note, uh, I do have my email address on the slides. If, um, want to. Tell me of your own observations or critique of Well, I, I've when I'm in Canberra, I always think I call it Ottawa South and uh, vice versa. You know what I mean? Canberra North, you know what I mean? Here in Ottawa, it's, it's just amazing uh, how similar they are. And then you get into the rivalry between Sydney and Melbourne and sort of Montreal, Toronto all over again. You know, this sort of thing. It's a. Uh, we have so many similarities, we can learn a great deal. So I'm opening the floor to questions. I don't see anything from the uh, from the virtual world. Please. Hi, um, we're actually meeting next week. So I will pick your brain and okay. my thoughts at that point. Um, but I was wondering now um, if you could share a little bit about how you think public trust feeds into the capacity for uh, digital government transformation in that you know the public service is there to serve the public. <laughs> trust have on that. So I just didn't quite get the last sentence. <laughs> Given that public service is yes. there to serve the public, yes. what role does public trust then have in the uh, ability of government to undergo digital transformation? Uh, I think it's become increasingly uh, more important. And certainly under the last government, um, the, the neoliberal conservative government, uh, uh, trust plunged greatly. Went, went down like that. Um, and it started to pick up again. Uh, so there's been much uh, greater, and this is in part because of corrupt practices. Um, so, uh, but uh, in Australia, I mean, there's been much more consciousness of this and uh, the prime minister's department had, you know, has started conducting surveys. Uh, so uh, and that will continue to be so. Um, the, I think there's still some ambivalence about people's experience, online experience, and in part, uh, this infrastructure audit, which 
I think in many respects is a great report uh, um, uh, is trying to address these sorts of issues. Look forward to catching up. Please. You mentioned international rankings a few times. I just want to know uh, where we are in Canada. And the conference uh, was opened by our uh, information officer. Yes. And I uh, want to understand that Canada is falling behind. Uh, so, from a comparative uh, historical perspective, uh, is that really the case? Oh, yeah. I didn't like Okay. Yeah. We're in Canada with respect to the government. Oh, I have been looking at it. Okay. No, no, I'm not, I'm not, no, no, I wouldn't use the word e government any longer, though. Uh, I mean, I think e government is favoured more by the United Nations UN report, and that may in part be because they're trying to encompass a, a much broader. Um, I mean, Canada's down from what it, what, what it was in the best years, and the best years were some time ago. Um, I, I mean, Australia uh, is sort of doing okay, uh, but if you're being aspirational, it's not. Uh, and the benchmark is, is, of course, I mean, the ludicrous thing about it is that benchmarks are often these countries which are so different. I mean, Denmark or Estonia or, or others are, um, are ranked, you know, the, round about the highest. Uh, well, why is that the case? I mean, you know, if a federal system can't operate in the way of a small, tight unitary system, it's, it's just bizarre. Uh, I'm sorry, I might add that, you know, um, some years ago, when the public sector reform thing had really picked up, for better or worse, um, it, uh, these out the four countries look showed up very well. But then suddenly, according to certain measurements, hey, they've been pipped. You know, it was upstart European, small European countries, Nordic countries, uh, which, according to some rankings, um, uh, were doing far better. And again, there was this question of scale uh, and all that. We had a good presentation from the Ukraine. They're, they're about the same size as we are. 40 million people, and uh, they also have a federated system, and they're in the middle of a war, and it's absolutely amazing what they've done to integrate their uh, e-service delivery and to integrate their data as well, mm. securely. So they, uh, anyways, whatever, it was, uh, it was a very good, uh, it was a very good presentation. Well, the imperatives come from a crisis. You know, it's just like the pandemic. I mean, you know, certain yes. th sorts of things have moved on very rapidly as a consequence. Yes. Um, and the thing is, the Ukraine, the population is moving around all over the place. Mm. So, e connectivity, like, you know, they might be in Kyrgyzstan one moment, the next minute they're in Kiev, but they still need to have access to their services. And mm. it's, it's very seamless. Mm. Sorry, go ahead. I apologize. No, no. Okay, no. It was a good presentation. Any other questions, please, David? Can I just riff quickly on the question about trust? I think there's a corollary to that, mm. and it's the trust of our workforce. Mm. So in in D and D and most of the uh, most governmental departments, people wake up in the 21st century to get in their smart car and take their smartphone to work. And in the case of D and D, they lock up the smartphone, mm -hmm. hold to the 19th century, and to work on dumb stuff with dumb people mm -hmm. on phone. Mm -hmm. so, and there's an element of that inside the public service as well. I can see that. But I'm wondering as well if there's not an element that, that can be aggregated to the uh, to the macro, which is that we the governments are becoming increasingly irrelevant to the people, and the people lack trust in them because they live in a different century, um, and we're going to have a, we're going to have a bigger gap between the governed and the governing uh, because the governed expect to be governed in a manner that's appropriate in the 21st century with the tools they have at hand. Oh. Hmm. Well, there there are. Um other strong voices in the debate, which I didn't develop, uh, which uh, are very sympathetic to that sort of idea. Uh, and I think Dunleavy and Margit, among others, uh, mm. sort of um, envisage a sort of citizen government, governance model in the future. Um, now that may be a little utopian at this stage, um, but 
Uh, there are people who are trying to conceptualize something about that. And of course, there's been a literature on uh, citizen democracy and engagement for a long time. Um, but it's moving more that way. It's a bit hard to, to determine at this stage how far it will go. Um, so. Any other questions, please? Thank you ever so much, John, for your presentation. Okay. I greatly appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. And if you want to take uh, five minutes and then we'll get the next speaker set up, that'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm.